Hey, St. Mark's family, friends, and visitors. Welcome to Online at St. Mark's. I am Sandra Thomas. Warren Coyle, Jeff Nesbitt, and I are your ministry team here at St. Mark's, and we're here to help you in worship this morning. We'll be leading you in worship, as well as Darlene Baker on piano, Jason Boyd on the organ. I have a team of choir members behind me, and also Vince Massimino is here for violin. So we're here at full force for you at home. Our tech team has been working all weekend to make sure that this is streamed well for you. I appreciate all the time that they spent doing that. They're awesome. Now I know that some of you may be in your pajamas, drinking coffee. I think I can actually see you, Scott and Linda. Y'all said that's what you would be doing. And so whether you are eating breakfast, or if you're just waking up, or if you got dressed up just like you were coming to church on Sunday morning, or if you're watching this later, we are glad to be here with you and glad that you are here. We will not be having worship on campus for a foreseeable future, and we will not be having our regularly scheduled ministries until we're clear to do so. But there will be videos made throughout the week by our ministry staff to keep you apprised and, and connected together because we are a connectional people. Send us your emails, call us, text us. We are all here for you. Today, stay engaged with us for worship. Sing along at home. When I did a video for the choir, I heard that Ben Curry was doing a bit of interpretive dance. I hope you're going to do that as well today, Ben. However, the Spirit leads you and moves you to be in worship. That's what we want you to do today. So now, if everyone just take a moment and breathe. Feel the Spirit of God as we bring the light of Christ to you.
reading from Psalm 23, the King James Version. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is the word of the Lord.
So here we are, gathered for worship, not because of our physical proximity, because that really doesn't matter. That's not what worship is. Worship is when we're gathered in spirit and in truth, as Jesus told the Samaritan woman. Long, long time ago, he said that. So we worship in spirit and truth, and each of our places, our living rooms, our kitchens, our bedrooms, wherever it is that we're gathered this morning, we can tabernacle that space as a temporary sanctuary as we worship the Lord together. Now, back when I was pastoring in Bolton, there's only one church in town that actually had an, an actual steeple with a bell. It was a pretty little Episcopal church that was next door to our church of the Methodist church. It was what they said was out of service. There were only two members who were actually on the roll. They were, only, they were the only two left there when I was sent there. In my seven years as pastor of the church in Bolton, the Methodist church, there were only two services held at St. Mary's. Both were funerals, and the rope was pulled, and the bell was tolled for each of the departed. Church bells have been going silent, unrung, and not because of the need for social distancing. The churches aren't shutting down but their bells are silent. Sometimes it's because the bells shake the belfry so bad that folks are afraid that the aging edifices will be damaged. Newer houses of worship don't have belfries or bells at all because, you know, they're really expensive. Even the cost of the electronic alternatives is kind of prohibitive. Well, I bring you this to all, all this to your attention this morning because there's a bell we sometimes forget to ring on days like today. Maybe it's because we get distracted by our own anxiety, which always makes it hard to pull any kind of rope, bell or otherwise. Maybe it's because we don't think it's very practical, so we devote our energy to focus on other things. It could be that some aren't sure that we ought to bother to bring it up at all. Just let things ride and see how things shake out. But I'm convinced that we need to ring it. And it's called the bell of hope. It might be that we've thrown it around so loosely that its meaning has come, become watered down well, do you think this thing's going to go on very long, Brother Warren? And I say, oh, I sure hope not. Will it be okay for me to go to beach for spring break? I hope so. Hope springs eternal. But as we continue on in the epistle to the Romans, the Apostle Paul in chapter 5 rings the bell of hope and invites us to grab on to the rope and bong the bell too. And so I want to direct your attention to Romans chapter 5 this morning. Hear now the word of the Lord. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, 
And character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we still were sinners, Christ died for us. Much more surely then, now that we have been justified by his blood, will we be saved through him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more surely, having been reconciled, we would be saved by his life. But more than that, we even boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Oh God, may the words of my mouth, the meditation of all of our hearts, wherever we are, be pleasing in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. If we take our cue from the secular culture around us, we might get the impression that hope is a purely human enterprise of always looking on the bright side of things. As if the state of affairs in the world or in our personal day-to-day -day challenges that we face depend on our own efforts to see the proverbial glass as being half empty or half full. Now, while I would agree that it's better to be joyfully optimistic than to be cynically pessimistic, optimism is only a part of what hope is. Or... If we read uncritically, if we read what's being published by some contemporary authors, we might get the idea that hope is a warmed over version of the power of positive thinking. We just plaster a toothy grin on our faces and let no magical things turn out bad. Our positive thoughts will turn this bad into good and it'll happen because nothing's going to get you down because you're thinking good thoughts. But understanding hope like that runs the risk of reducing God to a nebulous force, as in the force be with you, some kind of positive psychic energy. And the Lord is certainly more than that. If our definition of hope comes from the world around us, the peal of the bell of hope might degenerate into the tiny tinkle of wishful thinking. You know, all we need to do is visualize whatever the ideal outcome for us is, then align our lives with what we image that we conjure up. Now, hope may be looking forward to an ideal, but seeing hope like that reduces God to a cosmic Santa Claus who sits around waiting for our wish lists. And our God is way more than that. In Romans chapter 5, Paul begins with hope in an altogether different place. We boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us. Writing to the Christians in first century Rome, Paul knew that life was anything more anything but a positive ideal. The pagan culture in which they lived did its best to discredit their faith and destroy them at every turn. Their families and friends didn't get their belief in a man who was executed, whom they said lived in them because he was raised from the dead. As far as they were concerned, the concept of a dying and resurrected deity was confined to the realm of myth, of something that happened once upon a time, not something that actually happened in real time 30 years before this writing. So Christians were shunned by their families. Christians were banned as traitors for not worshiping the emperor as God. 
The authorities accused them of trying to overthrow the government, dismissing religion, which according to them was the worship of the gods of the Roman pantheon, which they said was superstition. So Christians in the empire were labeled subversive, atheistic. Couple that with the fact that because of its blatant corruption and immorality, the Roman Empire was beginning to crumble. And folks, even the emperors were looking for scapegoats. That made Christians easy targets. Yet in the midst of all that, Paul tells them to boast, to rejoice in their sufferings. At first glance, it seems that Paul thinks we ought to go around looking for ways to suffer as if the pressures of everyday living weren't enough. But notice how Paul puts it. We boast in our sufferings, not because of them. Paul writes that because of Christ's death and resurrection, we have peace with God. We're granted direct access to God. And that brings with it a whole new dimension to our lives that wasn't possible for humanity before Christ. God's love and the peace it brings is given to us not because we went around looking for it or because we're trying to make it happen. It is pure grace and unconditional gift. Now Paul's not one to sugarcoat reality as if Our access to God was hampered because our attitude wasn't right. Or that we couldn't experience God's love because our psychic energy wasn't sufficiently positive. He describes us as enemies of God due to our sin. But God initiated a reconciliation between us and him. God's love puts us in the position of having a right relationship with him before we could make an attitude adjustment. Before we could make our thoughts more positive. Even before we could clean up our own act. Because of this grace, this free, unmerited, unconditional acceptance of us, we have hope. See, hope is a product of what God has already done for us. Hope is present in us through the gift of God's Holy Spirit. This hope, which is rooted and grounded in God's love, helps us to grasp reality. Not how we would like for it to be, but as it is. We can rejoice even brag in the face of suffering because of what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. Whatever suffering we may encounter can produce endurance, which enables us to hang on to the rope of hope so that when we get to the end of our rope, his grace helps us to tie a knot and hang on. This Hanging on, this endurance produces character. This word character comes from a word that's also used in metallurgy for metal that's been heated to the point to where all the impurities are burned away. That line in how firm a foundation that I love. The flame shall not hurt thee, I only design thy dross to consume, and thy gold to refine. This purification of God's grace produces hope, this hope that won't let us down. We don't go running around looking for trouble, so God's going to give us some more hope. But neither do we ignore the trouble. That would be denial. And I don't think the Apostle Paul would ever recommend that. Because throughout his writings, Paul is realistic about sin and suffering in the world. And there's enough of that to go around for everybody, isn't there? But he does say that God can make the outcome of that suffering 
different. Instead of producing despair, God's love, a love shown to us in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, enables us to have a new understanding of the future. So I think that hope then is a third day, day after tomorrow thing. Today may be bad. Tomorrow might not be appreciably better. But the day after tomorrow has great possibilities because of what God has already accomplished through Christ. Hope isn't something we conjure up just to make it through another day. Hope comes from knowing that in everything, God works for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. It comes from remembering that Good Friday gave way to the day after tomorrow. The third day, that's Easter Sunday. Hope is based on what God has done and what God can do and is grounded in what God will continue to do because of his love for us. We don't need to worry about tomorrow or the day after that. Because, you know, God's already there, beckoning us to join him. Hope comes from knowing that just like God was with Jesus on Thursday in the Garden of Gethsemane as he agonized over facing his own death, that God was with him on Good Friday on Golgotha as he died on the cross. God is with us in our own Gethsemanes and Fridays, facing whatever it is that we have to face. And the love of God is poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. And that love helps us to know Sunday is the day of resurrection. God is with us waiting to bring new life of resurrection to us. Wanting to bring eternity to us in order to pull us toward a future that God has already redeemed. No matter how bad things might be today or tomorrow, God is bringing us to the day after tomorrow. You know, nowadays we only hear the song, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day, over the Muzak and the department stores during the holiday season, perhaps on the radio that starts playing the music way before Thanksgiving. Halloween, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. I don't know how that works. But in the poem that Henry Wadsworth Longfellow wrote, if we listen to that song, it writes of how, he writes of how the church bells told out carols about peace on earth, goodwill to men, he said. In that poem, he reflected on how they'd been the unbroken song from the belfries of Christendom. He then thought about the condition of the world as he wrote. The world around him, his own personal life, there wasn't a whole lot of peace for him. You see, his wife had died tragically when her dress had caught on fire and Longfellow severely burned his arms and hands trying to put the fire out. His eldest son distinguished himself in the Civil War but came back home paralyzed. And in that poem, Longfellow relates a moment of despair he feels when he writes, Hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to man. But it's interesting when we go on to the final stanza, his poem reads, Then peal the bells more loud and deep, God is not dead nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail with peace on earth. Goodwill to men. My friend Larry Nix has a radio show on WPBP, WPBP <laughs> radio. <laughs> he calls it Defining Moments. 
He said something like this one time. He said, maybe we shouldn't be telling God how big our problems are. Rather, we should be telling our problems just how big our God is. I think that goes for everything. Everything. Including COVID-19. This is a very strange time, isn't it? I've never experienced anything like this. I just remember stories told in historical record of the Sisters of Mercy in Vicksburg during the 1918 influenza outbreak who devoted themselves to caring for people who, who couldn't care for themselves anymore. And the Sisters of Mercy gave of themselves. And yes, some of them passed away from it. I think of those now today who work in places of healing and hospitals and clinics who are working to take care of us, working to see what it is that we can do. And so we need to pray for God to give them the wisdom to use the knowledge they have and to strengthen them in their work. God already has this thing worked out. My anxiety is it's not happening according to my timetable. But I learned a while back that I don't have to know everything. I just trust, have to trust in the one who does know everything. And I found in my short little life that that's more than enough. And you know, last I heard, they started ringing the bells at St. Mary's Episcopal Church Bolton again. And not just for funerals either. Looks like they made it to the day after tomorrow. And we will too. Today may not be great, but there is hope. Tomorrow might not be any better, but there is hope. We are an Easter people, and there is hope for the day after tomorrow. We have that hope because we have faith. As Christians, we do have faith. At this time, let us affirm that faith wherever you are. If you are able to stand, stand with us as we affirm our faith together with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Today, as we come to God in prayer, we want to make sure that we make intercessions, not only for ourselves, but for the whole world. Today, we especially want to remember Dennis O'Neill, 
uh, who had knee, sur knee surgery this past week and is now recovering at home. We want to remember Kristen Adkins. That's Ed and Jeannie Chapman's daughter. She lives in St. Louis. She's having complications in her pregnancy not due until May. I want to pray for family members of those who are working in the hospitals and clinics that they may keep watch, that they might have endurance that leads to character and hope. We also want to remember Jean Miracle Whitaker, who is currently undergoing radiation therapy for cancer. We want to remember her and all those we might lift up to our hearts. Today, as we pray together, one of the prayers of the people from the historic church we go to God with all our heart and with all our mind. And when we pray to the Lord, let us pray to the Lord saying, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above, for the loving kindness of God and for the salvation of our souls, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the world, for the welfare of the holy church of God, and for the unity of all people, let us pray to the Lord. For James, our bishop, for Connie, our district superintendent, and for all ministers of the gospel everywhere, let us pray to the Lord. For Donald, our president, our governor Tate, for the leaders of the nations, and for all in authority, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our community, for every city and community, and for those who live in them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For seasonable weather and for an abundance of the fruits of the earth, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the good earth which God has given us and for the wisdom and will to be good stewards over it, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who at this time travel on land, on water, in the air, through outer space, for travelers trying to get home, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the aged and infirm, for the widowed, and orphans, and for the sick and the suffering, especially those on our prayer list, those we have named, and those we lift in our hearts before you, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the poor and unemployed, for prisoners and captives, and for all who remember and care for them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For deliverance from all danger, violence, and oppression, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all the cares that burden us in our hearts, Lord, we lift them to you now.
O oh God, the author and fountain of hope, with trust and confidence, enable us to rely on your promises. Help us to know that the trials and hindrances of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed. Resting in your perfect love, may we look towards the light that shines more and more to that perfect day which you have already prepared for us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hold up, Vince. Today is also UMCOR Sunday, United Methodist Committee on Relief, that's already had hundreds of people and thousands of dollars at work in Mississippi and throughout our nation and world. We ask for your generous giving. And we know that the generosity that you want to express to your church and through your church in the name of Jesus will continue. We want to make that as easy as possible for you. While we can uh, certainly receive checks through our mail, we would ask also that you would consider looking on the inside of your bulletin, which Thelma has emailed to you this morning, which is already on our website. And there's a thing called a QR code right there, the little squiggly thing. I don't know a whole lot about it, but I understand that if you put your cell phone up to that, take a picture of that, it will take you directly to our Shelby Giving site where you can uh, register your gifts to the church. They'll automatically be, uh, come from your bank account and into our church's uh, uh, treasury. We don't know what the future holds, but we do know there will be some hardship involved. And we want to do our best to meet the needs of all that we can. And that comes because you're generous. Because whenever St. Mark's has been presented with a need, you have given. And we trust that you will still continue to do that, even though we're sort of at a kind of a limbo kind of a time. But remember, we're joined not in proximity physically, but spiritually by the presence of the Lord. And today, especially in a time like this, when so much is going on around us, we need to give God thanks for the blessings he's already given us and the blessings in faith we know he will continue to give us. And as we think about these this morning, we need to take a time out and lift up our own prayers of thanks to God.
All things come from you, O God. And with gratitude, we are quick to return to you what is yours. You created all that is and with love formed us in your image. When our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You sent your only son, Jesus Christ, to be our savior that we might know your great love for us. While we were yet sinners, he died for us. That proves your love for us. You provide us with hope in the midst of anxious days. Receive our gifts that will be transformed into messages and acts of hope to people in our community and across the world. Thank you, good Lord, for the opportunity you've given us to be your stewards of hope, a hope that does not disappoint us. We offer to you ourselves in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is What a Friend We Have in Jesus. And we at the church want you to know that the doors may be shut, the lights are on, and we're here. We're here to receive your emails, your phone calls. If there's anything that we could possibly do for you, please do not hesitate to let us know for we still want to be in ministry with you and for the world. Our closing hymn is What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Let's sing together.
I take refuge in the solace of knowing that Jesus Christ is your Lord and that God already has a future worked out. And the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with all of you wherever you are. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us serve the Lord in peace. Thank you.